Of all things still unknown within this world, time travel, things out of time, has to be one of the most fascinating theories of all time. Let's face it, it literally defines our lives. The creation of time itself, the measurement of time, attempts to cheat time, but ultimately, time was created by humans. And our creation of time will eventually catch all of us and come to a close. Sure, one needs to be a believer of some degree to even discuss time travel and these items that we find that are just not supposed to be here during this time. But the stories and information you are about to hear should really get you thinking. We are going to attempt to ask the questions that nobody may truly have the answers to, at least at this point in time. But as they say, time marches on. So what we may not be able to understand today or next year, maybe even in the next 10 years, we might need to revisit in a hundred. Bill and I invite you to join us tonight as we jump through wormholes and travel through space and time. From a child born into this world, we are taught what to believe. Close-minded we become fearful to be deceived. Still we desire to know what lies beyond that locked door. The art of the storyteller conjuring tales of legend and lore. History hidden, lost knowledge, things forgotten and the unknown. These are the things that direct us and will set the tone. Welcome friends to another episode of Nightmares on the Lost Highway. Well, you really focused on the word time. A lot of time. A lot of time there. Now, we talk about the behind the scenes and like how we come up with ideas. And sometimes these sure. ideas come together and they make more sense. And then sometimes we don't have time to really. There's that time uh, again. To talk about a topic before we sit down. And I think this is one where. We leave the table and we're actually going two separate ways. I think Eric had one sort of idea of what he was talking about. And when I read it, I interpreted it in a different way. Uh, not the first of which is to say I thought he talked about the College of Time Travel, and I'd never heard of that before. <laughs> then collage. Collage of Time Travel Stories, which <laughs> I refer to as an anthology. So even then, I was still like not sure what he was getting at. I think we got an age gap thing going on here. Well, I think of us as telling stories, and a collection of stories is an, an anthology. anthology. All right. So I think Eric looked more at people, and I looked more at things. So I think between the two of us, it does kind of come together and we cover a broad range of topics. And that's what's going to make this a great episode about time. But for me, you know, my time was spent looking up out of place artifacts, things that were found in, in places or in ways that they shouldn't have been. Uh, a lot of these, of course, archaeological finds that were found in stone that was, you know, those objects should not have existed when that stone was created. They're literally out of the timeline. Or technological marvels from a time before such technological marvels were supposed to exist. So, again, things that don't match the timeline. So, I think between the two of us, we're going to cover a lot of ground today. And obviously, we didn't want to go with strictly time travelers because we've already done a time traveler episode. Oh, yeah. Even though there's still more time travelers. I, I have a list of them on our idea list. But so. I know, like, we did an entire episode to uh, the John Teeter time traveler ordeal. We've well, mentioned and, and several. Well, and I mentioned several others in that episode. So... What is time? Well, in the simplest form, time is nothing more than a human's creation as a unit of measurement. So who created this concept of time? It's believed this was done by the Egyptians or the Babylonians. When was this done? Well, it's believed approximately 5,000 years ago. Before that, time, or the measurement of it, just simply didn't exist. Well, the concept of time the is sort of uniquely human. Yes. We're the only ones that quantify things in that way, I think. Because we have to wrap our tiny little minds around it to well, understand it. So, you know, the, the boss has to justify the eight hours you have to give him. So, <laughs> you know, I'm only taking a third of your day. Right. So for mind blowing concept number one, and this is a little off the rail, but if you'll follow along with me, I'll bring you back in time. Did you ever stop to think about I Okay. I, that was my fault. I kind of snickered at the fact that Eric keeps saying time. And so I guess I derailed him a little bit. I'm sorry. Well, it's all right. <laughs> We're, we can't be derailed, but it, we will stand fast at time. 
Did you ever stop to think about how much we, as humans, rely, or shall I say trust, these ancestors of ours some 5,000 years ago with this concept, a concept that some might argue is simply just made up, but as a human, as human nature works, we have to attempt to wrap our minds around the things that we experience each and every day. It's just a processing part of us. For the same reason psychiatrists can show us a small black and white ink blob and our mind sees an image of this random shape. It kind of goes back to the age-old concept we used to at least argue in school. Who says what peanut butter tastes like? I'm a big fan of the argument of who decides what money's worth. There's another one. It's just an abstract, I mean, little pieces of paper. Or even now, no, Let, let's even take it a step further. And now, nowadays, it's not even little pieces of paper. Oh, it's yeah. ones and zeros in a computer somewhere. Bitcoins. Who, who and decides everything. what my money's worth? You know, it, it all kind of goes back to that age-old concept, you know, of, of who defined this, who said this, who stated this, who dreamed this up. But like, seriously, maybe peanut butter actually tastes like chocolate and chocolate really tastes like jelly. How would we even know the difference? Our mind has been programmed to say that, yeah, peanut butter tastes like peanut butter. But what if whoever originally made that connection was wrong? Who's ever going to challenge that? My point is, just keep an open mind tonight as we go into this, because the same is true with time. And we have our pre-programmed concept of time, or the measurement in specifically of time. And there, you know, there, there's a second, there's 60 seconds and 60 seconds in a minute and 60 minutes in an hour and 24 hours in a day and so on and so forth. But is it just a unit of measure? And depending on how many outside factors, even that principle can be manipulated scientifically. Magnetism, for example, according to the general relativity and Einstein's research, a magnet itself would not affect time, but the field of magnetism could slightly skew time as we know it. Well, and you could even take that to gravity. We know gravity oh, affects absolutely. time. Yes. And the higher you are, the further you are away from a, a body, the, the slower time passes for you. Yes. To where the like astronauts, you are. astronauts in orbit basically gain like a insignificant amount of lifespan technically. I mean, it's measured in seconds, but still. Right. It all adds up. You know, Super high altitudes, weather, temperature, barigmatic pressures, you know, all can slightly skew this concept of time. And as Bill had mentioned, you know, further away from the rotation of the Earth and the gravity, such things as satellites revolving around the Earth can also slightly skew time. It's been scientifically proven if you take a clock with you as an astronaut leaving the Earth and you land on the moon and say that you stay there for two to three weeks. You could expect, due to the weaker gravitational pull that you would lose, approximately 58.6 milliseconds a day, falling behind in time from that compared to the Earth. Well, and even an individual's perception of time. When you're sitting in a hospital waiting for bad news, oh, good a minute can feel like an hour. And if you're sitting around the table playing games with your friends, an hour passes the in a minute. The entire night just vanishes, yeah. So even like an individual's perception of time. And again, I don't know about you. I mean, I know, you know, my, our work situations are different. But even me, you know, coming home from work and, and watching the clock, knowing, oh, I need to be in bed by a certain time. And then it seems like the more you look at it, the faster it goes. But there is that phenomenon where sometimes you'll look at a clock and the second hand will go the wrong way. Yeah. Like your mind perceives that for a brief moment, so... Well, and in your new position, you're driving, you know, a considerable amount every day. How many times have you already been driving and like you blink and you're like, wow, I missed yeah. that exit. I don't even remember, you know, it's like a lapse of time. I had a, maybe not related really, um, you know, when the time, time changed, you know, we, we, we did the time, daylight time, time. I was used to going to work when it was, was lighter outside. So when I was going to work and things were darker, like. I don't know. It was almost like it wasn't the same trip. Yeah, you got to reprogram your brain. <laughs> Absolutely. So is time travel, we'll just, we'll just talk on time travel at, right now. Is it even possible or is it just a bunch of science fiction mumbo jumbo? Well, I'm going to lean across the pond, so to speak, to an article published by the BBC back in November of 2023. This was by Michael Marshall. The ability 
to jump forward and backwards in time has long fascinated science fiction writers and everyone alike. So is it really possible to travel into the past and into the future? You know, Doctor Who especially is arguably one of the most famous stories about time travel, along the Time Machine and Back to the Future movies. It has explored the temptations and paradoxes and visiting the past and voyages to the future. And of course, now we've got the whole Marvel Cinematic Universe that's kind of doing the whole time deal as well. While time travel is a fundamentalist to Doctor Who, the show never tries to ground the TARDIS's abilities in anything resembling real-world physics. It would be odd to complain about this. You know, Doctor Who is a fairy tale quality that just doesn't aspire to be a realistic science fiction documentation. But what about in the real world? Could we ever build a time machine and possibly travel back? distant past or forward to see our great-great-great-grandchildren? You know, answer this question requires understanding of how time actually works, something scientists are far from certain about, and they have a million different suggestions and beliefs and theories. So far, what we can say with confidence is that traveling into the future is achievable, but traveling to the past is either wildly difficult or possibly absolutely impossible. We have Albert Einstein, one of the greatest thinkers of our time. You know, theories of relativity, which set out as a description in space and time and mass and gravity, a key outcome of relativity is that the flow of time isn't constant. Time can speed up or slow down depending on the circumstances, some of which we've already addressed. For example, time passes more slowly if you travel at a speed that you need to start approaching the speed of light for the effect to be significant. You know, this gives rise to the twin paradox in which one of the two identical twins becomes an astronaut and whizzes around the space at close to the speed of light while the other stays on Earth. The astronaut will age more slowly than the Earth-bound twin. If you travel and come back, you are really younger than the twin brother. Or at least that's what some scientists believe. Now, another possibility that is discussed is wormholes. In theory, it's possible for space-time to be folded like a piece of paper, allowing a tunnel, if you will, to be punched through the two edges of the paper as you fold them. And I'm trying to make a demonstration of folding here, and obviously you guys can't see that. Well, but. all I can think of when you say that is um, the movie Event Horizon. Yes. Which the spaceship, when it folds space, passes through hell in the middle. So yeah, no, I, yeah. I don't want to do that. Yeah, no, no. That's <laughs> not what we want to do. But relatively, you know, this wormhole concept offers some options for backwards time travel, but this time they are much more theoretical. People tie themselves up in knots trying to find ways to rearrange space-time in order to make time travel, to them at least, into the past possible. We simply don't know. We don't have all the pieces. We don't have all the understanding. But when these things are talked about, and then we discover or hear of stories, like Bill's going to talk about items that are found like at archaeological digs and different things that just simply, they shouldn't be there. You know, metal or whatever that doesn't exist for hundreds and hundreds of years, but yet here it is. I'm going to talk about maybe some more smaller stories that probably wouldn't have enough content for an entire episode, but stuff I thought was interesting. So, so while I kind of leaned into the time travel aspect of things. Like he said, I, I sort of focused on objects that didn't belong where they were found. And in some cases, these objects may be the result of time travel, but sometimes they simply appear as technology that shouldn't have existed at the time. So it goes back to some of our earlier topics where we say, you know, what did science get wrong? What has history got wrong? Did we have more advanced technology? Or again, were these technologies shared by some outside force? So where you were talking about, you know, time travel, I, I'm more looked at just items in places where they shouldn't belong. And so I think the two kind of do come together in a way. Absolutely. Especially as I talk about some of these things, you know, they're definitely, there, there could be an element of, of potential time travel. But basically, you know, an, an out-of-place artifact is the way I'm going to talk about it. It's just something that didn't belong where it was found. You know, like you said, in an archaeological dig where stone was dated so many thousands of years ago, and then say, for example, you find a cell phone. Yeah. You know, that, that doesn't belong. Something that, that didn't would quite add seem up. like a time travel artifact. So 
I, I kind of did a, a quick list of just some of the examples, and then I kind of did a deeper dive into a couple of them, which I'll get to later. But, you know, things like the 2,000-year-old Baghdad batteries using a technology for power generation. I mean, one, they didn't need electricity. They didn't use electricity at the time. Why would they need batteries? And so why would you need batteries to store that kind of energy? You know, in the Egyptian Temple of Hathor, there's a carving of a light bulb-like object where if you Remember seeing that. duplicate the light bulb, it will function. Now, was this a carving of a light bulb? Maybe, maybe not. But the technology definitely looks like it. Now, some will argue, again, it kind of goes back to our minds as a human trying to, we don't know what that object is, so we try to relate it to something we know. There's a, a great wall-like structure that was found in Texas, estimated to be between 200,000 and 400,000 years old, that looks man-made. But we weren't building structures like that in the time frame. There may not have even been people there in that time frame capable of that. One of the ones I found fairly interesting was the discovery of the evidence of a large-scale functioning nuclear reactor that seemed to have come into being 1.8 million years ago Wow! that, that operated for 500,000 years. Now, this was located in Africa. According to Dr. Glenn T. Seaborg, former head of the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission and Nobel Prize winner, so I think he knows his stuff. Legit. You know, it was not likely that this was in any way a natural phenomenon and must have been man-made. Since for uranium to burn in a reaction, very precise conditions are necessary, including the need for extremely pure water, much, much purer than any water naturally available. Now, there are people who say that this was a natural phenomenon. Hmm. How, how does that happen? I mean, this guy is an expert in the field, and he says it's impossible. You have the Piri Reis map of 1513. These maps include the physical structure of Antarctica, as it would look like without ice. <laughs> that hasn't been seen since the last ice age. Men could not have mapped no. Antarctica. No. And yet you have this Turkish admiral, Piri Reis, who has these maps that he had in 1513 that he had drawn based off earlier maps. How? How, how, does, how do these maps have does landforms we couldn't have found? Now, for potential time travel, 1852. John Buchanan Esquire presents to the Society of Antiquaries in Scotland a drill bit found encapsulated in 22 inches of coal. A drill bit, like that goes into bit. like an electric yep. drill, drill holes in wood well, or whatever. A, a larger scale drill bit. But, okay, okay. You know, the, the coal was 22 inches thick, buried in a bed of clay and boulders about seven feet thick. Now, if coal was formed hundreds of millions of years ago, mm -hmm. how does a drill bit bearing all the hallmarks of modern manufacture, end up in coal. You can't just drop it there, no. 18th century France. Quarry workers find tools stuck in a layer of limestone 50 feet underground. Human, modern manufactured tools in limestone 50 feet underground. Doesn't make sense. They discovered nanotechnology in the Ural Mountains. Small objects, only a few centimeters in size. They appeared in geological strata located between 9 and 36 feet deep which according to later dating would have ranged between 20,000 and 318,000 years old. Now, these items were mainly made of copper, with the smallest ones containing tungsten and molybdenum. Both of these metals have a very high melting point, 3,400 degrees for tungsten, and that's Celsius, 2,650 Celsius for molybdenum. Now, of course, the tiny, tiny size of these objects would have required highly developed technology to manufacture. Yeah, you don't just make a fire, campfire, and throw this stuff in a... Yeah, and these are little tiny pieces, like, they are, look, manufactured. So, again, either there was a technology that existed we don't understand, or people were able to travel to different times to drop off some of these items. You know, it's, it's the, you, you have a lot of little things like this. Coins found in the wrong places, wrong times. I found an article about a coin with all the hallmarks of being from Nazi Germany with the year 2036 stamped on it. <laughs> Say what? Yeah. Found in Mexico. In Mexico. We know the Nazi empire did not make it to 2036. No, not at least in our so timeline. Either there's a weird time travel or alternate dimension explanation to that. And yeah, we've talked about on our podcast on a couple different occasions, dedicated one entire episode to the Anunnaki. And to some of what Bill is saying, it, it kind of goes back to that whole, is it out of our time sequence or possibly was it a technology that existed at one time 
and it went away for whatever reason, or we basically become an extinct and we came back, we were given another chance, but we were dumbed down. I mean, there's a lot of different possibilities there. But, you know, the Anunnaki is one of the things I, I swear you can go on Reddit or YouTube or anything. The Anunnaki is is making a move here on Earth on at least the uh, Internet and the it's stories. It's trending. It's trending hard, you know, with a lot of, I think, loosely explain a lot of the stuff that they're now finding. I'm going to kind of steer back to where I wanted to, uh, where I started off, and that is just various different little tales of time travel. And one of my absolute favorite stories is called, or I call it the Times Square Traveler. And this is one I've heard of for, for years, and it always intrigued me. And it is still one of those that if you do a search, uh, New York Time Traveler, Times Square Traveler, you're, you're still going to find a lot of trending information on this. But in a nutshell, here's the story. One of New York City's most famous, we'll call it an urban legend, tells the strange tale of a time traveler. Now, according to the story, a 30-year-old man was spotted in Times Square at about 11.15 p.m. on this random day in June of 1950. Now, no one knew how he had gotten there. People that were around him don't remember him walking. He just like blinked and appeared in the middle of the street. Now, this man was also dressed in late 19th century clothing and appeared to be dazed and confused. One witness uh, recorded that they saw this individual basically just kind of like staring up at the skyscrapers, of course, the big blinking Times Square lights and different things, and and that deer-in-the-headlight look. Now, shortly following this incident, the man was accidentally hit by a taxi because, literally, he (laughs) appeared just in the street. Just boom, taxi comes along plows him down. He died, unfortunately. So nobody ever got to talk to him. Nobody ever got to question him. It was just like, hey, this guy just appears out of nowhere. Oh my gosh, he just got hit by a taxi. Oh my gosh, he's dead. So they start going through his personal belongings that he had on him. And the following items were found in his pocket. First off was a business card belonging to someone named Rudolph Fentz, F-E-N-T-Z. There was also a letter sent from Philadelphia dated 1876 to an address on Fifth Avenue. He also had a small bundle of old banknotes from like the 1880s, 1890s time frame. A copper token for a beer also they found within his pocket, which bore the name of an unknown saloon. There was also a bill for the care of a horse-drawn stable that was not listed in any address book, but said that it did appear at one time in New York, at least on the bill, handwritten. Now, strangely enough, none of these items were, like, aged. You can tell if a piece of paper is aged. I mean, you know, it it starts to break down, ink starts to bleed, the paper gets brittle. They say the paper usually turns yellow. Yeah. These things look like they were brand new, like literally right out of the timeline. Now, following the incident, an investigation was supposedly carried out. Again, we're going all the way back to 1950. A lot of what you will find is the same stuff rinsed, repeated. But they said they they did attempt to do uh, an investigation as well as they could. And I did find the name of a Captain Hubert V. Rim, I believe is how you would pronounce his last name. It's R-I-H-M, Rim, of the New York uh, Police Department's Missing Persons Department which revealed that a man with the same name had in fact disappeared without a trace back in 1876. Now, the history behind the story, I wanted to dive in a little bit deeper because this is, and I use the word, urban legend. In the 1970s and the 1980s, this tale was actually spread and published, as a fact, on numerous occasions. Eventually, it was linked back to a short story entitled I'm Scared, which was written by science fiction writer Jack Finney. Today, most people have accepted this story to be purely fictional. However, there are still pieces of the puzzle that have yet to be explained. Researchers, for example, have actually found proof now of a real person named Rudolph Fentz, 
who did mysteriously disappear at the age of 29 years in 1876. So now possibly this fictional writer did a little homework, did a little research, you could always argue. But regardless, I've always just, I've loved that story. To me, that is just so bizarre. I don't think I'd ever heard that one. Well, my deep dive, I found a couple of particular items that really, one, which really seemed out of place, and the other, which definitely seemed out of time. So <laughs> the first is, is called the Antikythera Mechanism, and it is an ancient form of analog computer. It was discovered in 1901 when a diver, you know, in one of those old school copper helmet, you know, glass hinge thing. Weighted boots that hold you down. The canvas diving suit. He emerged from the Mediterranean Sea, shaking in fear and mumbling about a heap of dead naked people. Dead naked people under here. When divers returned to the area, they found these dead naked people to actually be marble sculptures scattered across the seafloor, along with other artifacts. There was a shipwreck. Ah. Well, one of the objects recovered from the site appeared to be nothing more than a dictionary-sized lump. It was clearly something, but they didn't know what it was, and they collected it along with everything else. Months later, at the National Archaeological Museum in Athens, the lump was broken apart, and it revealed some bronze gears inside, wheels the size of coins. Now, according to historical knowledge of the time, gears like these should not have appeared anywhere in ancient Greece, nor anywhere else in the world, for, for many centuries after the shipwreck they were found in. Now, the shipwreck itself dated to between 60 and 70 B.C. The device itself is said to have been created sometime between 205 and 600 B.C. Now, the device and its workings are sort of based on the theories of astronomy and mathematics, believed to have been developed by the ancient Greeks, all the way back to Pythagoras of the Pythagorean Theorem, Mm -hmm. who, you know, know, observed these things. Its design and workmanship reflect a previously unknown degree of sophistication and engineering. Now, some experts do say it's not implausible, but it's really not in line with a lot of the technology that you find at that point in time. It's far, far more advanced than it should be. As a matter of fact, even some of the greatest minds of modern time trying to rebuild the device, one, it took them years to reconstruct it to figure out what it even did, and two, once they built it, they were amazed by what it could do. This, this contraption, which, you know, again, it, it's not very big, the size of a book, is capable of predicting astronomical positions and eclipses for up to 19 years for astrological purposes and the exact date of six ancient Greek contests, including the four major Panhellenic games. And all this is achieved by simply turning a crank on the side of the device and watching the motions of its pieces. Hmm. Now you said a lot of these gears, they were made of like brass? Bronze. Uh, br- okay. Bronze. Yeah. Again, small pieces, very, th- those metals are a softer metal, very hard to work with. And precision made. I mean, precision yeah. made. Yeah. They're not Little gears that are meant to fit in each other and, and work in, a, in a gear ratios, you know, things like that. Because I'm trying to wrap my mind around, you know, we had old watches and, and some different things back, you know, but not that far back, obviously. Not that far back, yeah. That came way later where, you know, like the Swiss watches and all that with the tiny little gears. But this, yeah, that's totally, yeah. yeah. that does not add up. It is known that this wasn't the only device of this type since there are documentations of Cicero speaking of such devices. So they weren't known but it's so far advanced beyond what everything else was. So at some point in time, these devices were being built, but it wouldn't be until almost 1,600 years later that they were able to develop similar technology in Europe. Hmm. So, you know, you have this this amazingly complicated little mechanical computer that times out the movement of the planets and predicts eclipses and all these other things. I mean, there are entire papers written about this, the gears, there's... You know, the pieces, like I said, it, it some of the best trained people looking at this, it took them years just to recreate what it did. And they... They didn't even understand what it was they were building, well, truthfully, to, you know, to be amazed by everything that it could do. Well, my understanding is even at one point, they sort of stumbled upon it by accident by thinking about the European astronomical clock. Somebody just simply said, like, one of these pieces looks similar. And then somebody was like, what if that's what this is? But the idea that that's what it could be just wouldn't even occur to them because, again, so far. That technology wasn't supposed to exist for another 1,600 years. Very interesting. My next story is from IT, India News Online, and it was written by an R. Banner G. This appeared in uh, July 2016. And the story is of a newspaper article written 11 years prior to occur in the future. You know, news agencies would kill for a story written 11 years ahead of its time. 
But honestly, if this were to happen with me, I think I'd kind of lose my marbles and I'd freak out a little bit. This is a spine chilling, tingling story. And it was part of a book, the little giant book of eerie thrills and unspeakable chills. I love that book title. I'd read that. I would read that. <laughs> I would so read that. Now, that book was written by Ron Edwards, uh, a C.B. Colby, and John Macklin as a collage work. Now, according to the authors, this was back in 1932, newspaper reporter J. Bernard Hutton and a photographer, Joachim Brandt, were sent to do a feature story on the Hamburg shipyard in Germany. Now, after completing their assignment, just as they were about to leave the premises, they heard the sound of aircraft engines, only to look up and see the sky full of fighter planes. The anti-aircraft batteries opened fire and bombs started going off. All of a sudden, this place had become an instant war zone. Things were exploding. Buildings were collapsing. There was death and chaos everywhere. Before rushing out to save their lives, Hutton even asked a security guard if there was something they could do to help out, but was asked to immediately leave the area instead. As the two drove into Hamburg, things changed. The sky cleared up and everything went back to being normal. There was no blood. There was no violence. The buildings were fine. No one seemed to panic. It was as if nothing had happened at all. When Hutton and Brandt looked behind towards the shipyard, they couldn't even spot anything wrong with it. There was no damage. There was no smoke, no fires coming out of the building. Shocking. The newspaper office obviously did not believe anything these two said. It was even joked off, you know, the pictures that Brandt had been taking during the attack showed everything to be normal. But when they snapped them, they said, no, this was when the plane was dropping the bombs. And as your boss was looking at those, it's like, that's an empty building with clouds in the sky. The shipyard itself looked good as new. Their colleagues dismissed their claim and actually joked and decided that they had must have stopped on their way for a bit of a drink and it was the alcohol making them see things. Now, Bernard Hutton later moved to London just before the Second World War began in 1943. When he picked up a newspaper one morning and it almost made his heart stop as he began to read the pages, it was a story about a successful raid by the Royal Air Force Squadron on the Hamburg shipyard. The resemblance was uncanny. This was an exact representation of what he and Brandt witnessed 11 years back. To the point, he dug out his old notes and diaries that the two had kind of put together because no one else believed them. So they talked about it and they thought, we're going to write this down. And it was exactly as they had written 11 years prior actually came to be. How? So an artifact was found in London, Texas, June 1934. It was found by a local couple while out walking along the Red Creek. They noticed a strange piece of loose rock with a bit of wood embedded in it, and they took it home. Ten years later, their son broke it open, being the kind of kid that likes to break things to see what's inside of them. I was one of those kids. And discovered a hammerhead concealed inside. Like a hammer, yeah. carpenter yeah. hammerhead. Okay. Well, like a mining hammer. A mining hammer, okay. Now, it's a hammer made of iron and wood, and the stone that it was cased in was said to be 400 million years old. 400 million years old. Now, this is a man-made tool tested to be much younger than the rock surrounding it. It would appear as if whoever dropped it might have been running from a triceratops when they did so. <laughs> it is identical to 19th century mining hammers. So here you have this hammer of presumably relatively modern make at the time, 19th century. So that's the 1800s. Mm -hmm. And obviously that, that's, I mean, by any account, that's way, way, way out of where it should have been. I'm just thinking, being an antique person myself, trying to remember exactly the date time frame for tools when people started stamping. And I think somewhere along that time frame, you know, not saying a local blacksmith yeah. would, would necessarily mark everything, but big companies that were starting to produce stuff would have had marks on there. Yeah. That'd been interesting. Well, creationist Carl Bau bought the hammer in 1983 and claimed it to be a monumental pre-flood discovery. His thought was not that it was time travel, but again, if people can slip through time, well, surely objects could. 
Now, Ba has used the artifact to advance speculation that the atmospheric quality of pre-flood Earth would have encouraged the growth of giants. I'm not sure how a man-made hammer proves the giants existed, but hey, we'll give the guy all the credit he wants. Kudos. Stylistically, the design is consistent with American tools manufactured in the late 19th century. Now, according to some experts, it is possible that due to a known but rare process, the rock could have formed around the hammer in the last 100 years. It's apparently, like I said, a rare process, but it is not unheard of. It does happen. I'm just thinking, you know, some poor guy working in a mine and he drops his hammer down in a wooden bucket and it goes to reach he for goes it. To grab it's it and it's gone. not there. And it just appears inside this rock somewhere else. Well, again, even <laughs> when you go back to our time travel episode where I talked about the flight, the world, the, the plane flight that flew over an airport that yes. didn't exist. Yes. You know, um, you know, if people can slip through time, I mean, yeah, like objects should be able to slip I through think time. think it would be easier. Well, I've got a couple more stories. One of them is, is really short, but I thought it, it was too interesting not to bring up. And a lot of my time travel stories, I I literally was looking for the most popular time travel stories. And another one of these, I actually found the best representation on uh, India News, again online, uh, again by this same author, R. Banner Jai. Now, this particular article uh, appeared in July 2016. The story of a time traveler who came back to Wall Street to make a fortune. Well, if you were going to do it, why not? Do it in style, man. On the 28th of January, 2003, a certain Andrew Carlson was arrested and detained by the police for insider trading on Wall Street. It's insane, really. Over a two-week period in the stock market, Andrew went from having $800 to making, wait for this, $800, turning it into $350 million. It's like whatever he invested in turned to gold, platinum. It is nearly impossible to make those kind of profits that he did. He was arrested by the cops on allegations that he must have had illegal insider information. I love that part. We're going to arrest you, sounds like, on speculation. You just did too good. This has to be fraud, so we're going to arrest you. Hey, they'll kick you out of a casino for that. So Okay, okay. Now, when he was asked, how did you do this? The cops weren't really expecting what Andrew had to say. He was very blunt. He said, he claims, I am a man from the year 2256. Since I'm from the future, I knew exactly how the stocks were going to perform. Now, obviously, the cops thought this guy was chattering utter rubbish. But get this, soon after he was released on bail, Apparently, they didn't have a whole lot to to continue to hold him. His bail was paid, so he gets loose. The man disappears off the face of the earth. And even after repeated attempts, he could not be found. Was he telling the truth? Who knows? But get this. Carlson predicted the exact date of the U.S. invasion in Iraq while he was in there trying to convince the police, hey, I'm a time traveler. That's all I've done wrong. It wasn't insider trading, or was it? It, Would that be insider trading? I I mean, he did have knowledge no one else was privy to. It definitely did, but (laughs) I I don't know. To me, insider trading is like someone leaked information. I mean, I I guess you leaked it to yourself. The definition of insider trading is is that, but I think when when you get charged with insider trading, it's simply having access to information that nobody else had access to, so... So shame on you for using what you know and well, the knowledge. Well, Congress people, <laughs> Congress people can get in trouble if they sell stocks ahead of, you know, well, yeah, major. So yeah. they don't have insider information from the company, but they still have information no one else had. But $800 to $350 million in two weeks. That's a magic trick I'd like to learn. I would love that one. Another story. The Mystery Man from Tared. Now, this one's a really strange account, which um, honestly remains unanswered. The story goes like this. On a hot afternoon, July of 1954, a man arrived at the, I'm probably butchered this, but it's Hadina Airport, also known as the Tokyo International Airport. We're going to go with that. He was described as being Caucasian man with a beard, and this man is known to have uh, been French, but he was pretty fluent in other languages as well, including Japanese. 
Now, there's a couple versions of the story. Some say that the man handed over his passport to be stamped by the Japanese immigration officials. When the officers realized that while the passport did seem to be perfectly fine, perfectly legit and legal, the country in which it was issued, which was Tarid, did not exist in real life. I've heard this one before. Mm -hmm. And another slightly different version, the man mentioned that he was from Tarid. And when the officers didn't believe him, he then showed the passport. But either way, the man tried his best to convince the officers that Tarid does in fact exist in real life. Now, if, if I remember the version I heard, I think he even produced currency at I, one point. Yes, yes. He had yeah. some coins or tokens. So, some, some form of money that was from a country that didn't exist. Now, he argued, he claimed that, yeah, Tarid exists. It's, it's there between France and Spain. They even pulled out a map to humor him. And, you know, he's using his finger and trying to pinpoint this. Now, he claims that his hometown wasn't, it's, it's not a new town, he goes, either. So it's been around for at least a thousand years. Eventually, when the man was shown this world map, he pointed to the area, which is currently the principality of Andorra. He genuinely seemed confused as to why the authorities were so hell-bent on calling this place Andorra. Eventually, the immigration officers arrested the man on suspicions of being a criminal to interrogate him further and figure what in God's name was going on with this guy. He was shifted to a hotel nearby. Now, two guards were positioned outside his room. But guess what happened? When they went to check on the man the next day, poof! vanished, no sign, no trace. There was no sign of an escape. The windows were actually those type windows that did not open because it was on an upper level. There was no way physically out of this room except for the door where two guards had been posted. Even the documents he was carrying with him, which could have been used as evidence of this man's existence, those disappeared as well. Could it have been a man from the future? Or more interestingly, could he have been living in a parallel universe of sorts, where Andorra is known as Tarid, maybe in his realm? More logically, all of this could also just be the work of a talented storyteller. Unfortunately, there's no way to tell. Now, another gentleman I think most people have heard of, the famous Stephen Hawking. What's his beliefs on time travel? He was an intelligent man, had a lot of beliefs. Hate to be this guy. I don't think he has any thoughts on time travel right now. Uh, yeah, not right now. <laughs> true that, true what, that. What were his thoughts? What were his <laughs> thoughts? They interviewed him. You know, has anyone ever traveled in time was the question that was relayed to Stephen Hawking. We all travel in time. Well, yeah, every day. Every day. Every day. His response, and as you know, physicist Stephen Hawking pointed out in his book, Black Holes and Baby Universes, which was written by Bantam Books in 1994. He states, the best evidence we have that time travel is not possible and never will be is the fact that we've not been invaded by hordes of tourists from the future. Science does support some amounts of time bending, though. If you use and I'm going to be nerdy here. If you use the Marvel idea of time travel. Feeling nerdy. Weird Al. The fact that there are infinite branches of time, then we just simply live in a timeline that's never been visited. Touche. Because for you to travel in time, you don't travel back in time. Time is linear for you. Mm -hmm. Right? So even if you travel back in time, you don't really travel back in time. It just becomes your future. You just live it in the past. Live it in the past. So again, maybe we just live in a different branch. Because... If, if you adhere to that idea, the multiverse theory and all that, there are infinite branches of the universe where every decision that was ever made was made one way or the other. So that leads to an infinite number of potential universes. And we know that there are multiple dimensions, multiple universes, if you will. So who's to say we don't just live in a timeline where no one came to visit? Maybe this timeline is the least interesting timeline, which, <laughs> to be fair, if it is, wow. it's still pretty rough. Yeah. This timeline ain't yeah. great. <laughs> and I think there's proof. I mean, obviously, uh, if you ask the great crystal ball of Mickey Mouse, Disney, who owns, you know, most everything around, they don't own Back to the Future because Back to the Future, if you travel back in time, you can really mess up <laughs> your future. But in the Marvel light of things, that doesn't really work that way. And I, th I think my own thoughts on time travel is they would lean more towards the Marvel 
model of it. Make a little bit. I don't more think sense you can you. go back and change. If you could go back and change your existence, then you would never exist. exist. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. Well, not to poke holes or tear anything down. Wormholes? Poking wormholes? Should you find yourself confronted by a time traveler? Stop, drop, need, and roll. Well, no. Oh, that'd be weird. That would be weird. But you should look at a calendar. Because according to nationaldaycalendar.com, December 8th is pretend to be a time traveler day. I never knew this existed. Now, this started in 2007. Okay. So it is relatively, relatively new. new. You know, in the span in, in, in the span of time. Uh, in time. Pretend to be a time traveler day encourages us to step from our TARDIS or <laughs> flip open our Omni while wearing clothes from the past. At the same time, we should act appropriately confused by certain technology. Now, time travel has captured our imaginations for generations. Science and authors keep coming back to the topic again and again, so it should be no surprise that there would be a day where you should just pretend to be a time traveler. The original blog post that got the day rolling can be found on the Geek USA blog. But for more resources on how to be a time traveler, or to at least act like one, you can explore the wide array of television and movies produced over the decades. For example, the original Doctor Who. You know, some might say there's plenty of resource material right there, but but why stop there? If you're going to make a list, let's make a real list. So, TV shows. Doctor Who, Quantum Leap, Outlander, Voyagers, The Time Tunnel, True Calling, Continuum, 112263, Fringe, Books, A Wrinkle in Time, The Time Machine, The Magic Treehouse Series, a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court, The Restaurant at the End of the Universe, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, The Time Traveler's Wife, Movies, Groundhog Day, Back to the Future, Terminator, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, Midnight in Paris, Edge of Tomorrow, About Time, Peggy Sue Got Married. Timeline is another yeah. great movie. So how to observe, pretend to be a time traveler day. Well, act like... Act accordingly. Act like a time traveler. Choose your time period and decide whether you are traveling to the past or to the future. Be overly shocked when someone says things like, I'd kill for a double mocha latte right now, or that car is the bomb. <laughs> Misuse technology. When someone offers you earbuds to listen to a new song, and I, I was, sniff them to see if they smell good. <laughs> <laughs> Nose plugs. Put them in no. your nostrils. Now, the original blog post includes more tips for your time travel shenanigans, saying, quote, you must spend the entire day in costume and character. The only rule is that you cannot actually tell anyone that you are a time traveler. Other than that, anything's fair game. Here are your possible options. Number one, utopian or cliche future, like Star Trek The Next Generation. Dress with moderately anachronistic clothing and speak in slang from varying decades. Greet people by referring to things that don't yet exist or haven't existed for a long time. Examples. Have you penetrated the atmosphere lately? <laughs> what spectrum will today's broadcast be in? Or your king must be a kindly soul. <laughs> Show extreme ignorance in operating regular technology. Pay phones should be a complete mystery. Try placing the receiver in odd places. Chuckle knowingly at cell phones. Number two, dystopian future. Any kind of future from Terminator to Friedrich. The important thing to remember is dress like a crazy person with armor. <laughs> if you go to the prisoner who's escaped the future, try shaving your head and putting a barcode on the back of your neck. Then stagger around and stare at the sky as if you've never seen it before. Walk up to random people and say, what year is this? And when they tell you, get quiet and then say, then there's still time and run off. <laughs> Stay in front of a statue, any statue, really. Fall to your knees and yell, no! <laughs> Stare at newspaper headlines and look astonished. Take some trinket with you. It could be anything, really. Hand it to some stranger along with a phone number and say, in 30 years, dial this number. You'll know what to do after that. And then slip away. Talk about messing with people. Option three, travel from the past. This one's for beginners. Dress in period clothing, preferably Victorian era, and stagger around amazed at everything. Airplanes are terrifying. Also, carry on conversations with televisions for a while. Discover and become obsessed with one trivial aspect of technology, like automatic grocery doors. Stay there for hours just playing with it. <laughs> Be generally terrified of people who are dressed immodestly compared to your era. Tattoos and shorts on women are especially scary. Remember, the only real rule is staying in character and, and try to fit in. Never directly admit you're a time traveler and make really, really bad attempts at keeping a low profile. I think that would be hilarious. I would love it, but yeah, it would be. I think there might be some people finding themselves locked away by the end of the day. Yeah. But while you were going through this, I was thinking of other possibilities. Dress like a Bigfoot day. <laughs> and then I thought, living in rural Missouri, no, that's you probably a horrible, horrible idea. So I'm, we're going to go with the worst. Uh, so December 8th, I'm going to have to put that on my calendar. Well, is it time for headlines, Eric? It is time for headlines.
Irish Star Newspaper by John O'Sullivan, February 24th, 2024. Not all very long ago at all. Eno Olerich, who is also known as the Radiant Time Traveler on TikTok, has built up quite the following of more than 826,000 followers. You rat bastard. Did I steal yours? You stole my head. Woohoo! Well, before we get too much further, Eric, we're only going to have one uh, headline because mine is uh, uh, about him as well. Great minds. It, might be, it might be a different article. Mine's from the mirror.co.uk. So. Well, mine's from the Irish Star. But I'm, I'm going to assume they're probably going to be pretty similar. Probably pretty close. This gentleman has 826,000 followers as he tells of looming catastrophes that are set to affect the world. In this chilling tale, a self-proclaimed time traveler, as he states, he goes by the handle Radiant Time Traveler on TikTok. Says he's back from the year 2671 with a warning of upcoming disasters. Now, Eno Alric has more than, again, 826,000 followers who listen to his predictions, all kinds of predictions. This is just one example about potential calamities that could hit our planet. Now, in some earlier posts, Alric warned followers about twin planets crashing into Earth extraterrestrial visitors, and the possible start of World War III. Now, this time, he spoke about a strange and frightening occurrence, events that he claims are coming up. These include earthquakes and a Pandora's box opening a path to another universe. But first, he warns of unprecedented, destructive tornadoes, the likes in which we have never seen before. A Force Six. He predicts it will strike Houston, Texas, causing extensive damage to humanity. And he begins his prediction saying, attention, yes, I am a real time traveler. These are major events to come in the rest of 2024. Then he dives into the specifics, starting with part one, February 17th, the first ever F6 tornado occurs hitting Houston, Texas. It destroys almost the entire city, making the worst tornado in history and mankind. Well, he got that one wrong. He, he missed that one by a mark. March 28th, an ancient artifact is found and discovered. When it's touched, it sends you to another universe. It's called Pandora's Box. The universe can be very similar or completely different, like people being on a Dorito-shaped aspect. Not sure what that really has to do with anything, but that was his words. April 2nd, a 9.8 magnitude earthquake that they call Big John occurs in the San Andreas Fault region. Now, soon after this, a 750 foot high tsunami hits California coastline. Many large cities are in ruins, including, but not limited to, San Francisco. May 15th, an alien lands on Earth known as the Champion. He is here to take 10,000 people to another habitable planet. He was here once before. He has returned to try to save us because they do not want to randomly choose. So he has come back and hand-selected these 10,000 people. Well, mine pick up right where yours left off. All right. May 27th. A second civil war begins in the USA when Texas secedes from the rest of the country. Other countries take sides, beginning World War III. Nuclear weapons are used. June 4th, the first ever human-chimp hybrid is made. It has fur, a tail, and can speak to humans and monkeys. It begins teaching other monkeys to speak, and they eventually become full members of society. Planet of the Apes. Good for those monkeys. Good monkey. You know, in a world where if you're the wrong skin tone, you don't really get to be part of society sometimes. I yeah. find it hard to believe we'd let the monkeys be yeah. part of it. Not to be racist. I absolutely, you know, hey, I'm all for it. If the monkeys can speak, you know, give them some credit. July 24th, the Yellowstone volcano erupts, covering almost the entire U.S. and Canada in ash. It is a super volcano that stretches two thirds of the way across the U.S. It creates a canyon four times larger than the Grand Canyon. In case you're wondering, it can get stranger. August 15th. Dragons are discovered in the Rocky Mountains. Hell yeah. They can fly, breathe fire, and speak. Finally, September 15th, the first ever hypercane. It's the U.S. East Coast, a hurricane with over 500 mile per hour wind speed. Hypercane. I mean, I think really this guy's just throwing anything at the wall and seeing what sticks. Yeah. Because, I mean, if you predict enough weird crap on enough days, one of those is bound to be something close, right? Well, 
and I hate to be that guy, but I mean, some of the things that he's talking about, Texas succeeding and, and, and uh, the Yellowstone volcano, I mean. Hey, I'm terrified of the Yellowstone volcano. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're getting, there's earthquakes and there's a lot well, more started, motion going on there. We started having a lot of quakes on the New Madrid again. Yes, we did. Yes, so. we did. But yeah, these prophecies have, have gained enormous popularity among oh, the yeah. followers. I don't know about you. Uh, I've spent some time on TikTok. I loved these things when oh, I yeah. found them. But, I would mark them and read them. And, but then obviously some of the dates have come and gone. Yeah. And, you know, nothing, nothing occurred. However, I did think it was interesting. He's starting to get, you know, out of all these followers, people can also leave him comments. And, you know, so while a lot of these prophecies have gained enormous popularity, some people are kind of writing back. One person writes, I live in Houston and do not approve of this message. I have one that says, not even close to being believable. Yeah. Another one says, I don't think you have any idea of how big Houston really is. I like this guy. He never gives up. <laughs> Another, however, you know, there's been so many numerous skeptics. One comment says, please make a video of all your predictions that have come true to pass. And another, you know, remarked, and they only share the bad things. Why not share some positive thing for a change? Hey, here's one. Can't wait to see the dragons. Me too. That was, <laughs> I was sorry to say that was me, but no, I'd be lying, but I, I'm totally with that one. Another comment. How come no time traveler can ever share the winning lottery numbers, bub? Yeah, that seems unethical. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta travel back in time. You can't give somebody that. Well, my question kind of ties into something that I've always found a little humorous ever since I first discovered it. Okay. This is an actual newspaper ad, the classified section, 1977. I, I stumbled upon it while doing, you know, gathering my research and I was like, I got to find a way to use this. There wasn't enough there for a whole story, but the more I thought about it, I'm like, that's my question. Remember, real ad, 1977. Real article. Wanted somebody to go back in time with me. This is not a joke. P.O. Box 322, Oak View, California, 93022. You'll get paid after we get back. Must bring your own weapons. Safety not guaranteed. I have only done this once before. <laughs> wow. And this was when? What year? 1977. 1970? I would have been seven years old, showing my age here. I, well, depending on when it posted, I might not have been you born yet. You may not have even been born yet. Hmm. Do, do, you, do you answer the ad? If there was any way possible, just out of total curiosity and intrigue, curiosity killed the cat, determination brought him back. Uh, yeah, I, I think I would have to going in thinking this is definitely going to be a prank, but if it, if it was local, yeah, I would have to say I would be intrigued by something. I would at least like if there was a phone number provided, I might call and or an email address or something. I don't know if I'd be willing to go to someone's address. Yeah. <laughs> Safety is, is not guaranteed, I think it said. So yeah, bring your own weapons. Bring so your own weapons. I've only done this once. You get down there and you got a bunch of hunters out in the woods and it's like, run, boy. <laughs> yeah, no, I, that's a, seen that movie. <laughs> All right. Well, my question, I, I touched upon actually tonight in the podcast, but I kind of wanted to get into it again, more of a humorous side. When we selected this, this topic for tonight's episode, it was because honestly, my weird family had gotten off on a similar topic. So this one drew my attention. I'm weird. My family's weird. We love each other. That's the way it works. But um, it was still fresh on my mind. And this was my son, Alex's comment. You know, he's kind of our, as Bill says, our producer at this point. Helps us with the recording stuff. But he'd come into the living room and he's, uh, he'd seen something online uh, and it got him thinking. And this is so typical. Let me just say, this is this is not like, a once in a lifetime. This almost every night, one of us, oh my gosh, you'll never see what I read today or what I saw today. You know, we're just that weird type of family. But this topic had to deal with time. You know, again, who created it? When was it created? And honestly, you know, how was, how was it that something just humans just dreamed up to help us wrap our little brains around aging that we're on the spiraling, spinning rock in space and orbit? You know, I never really thought about it until. He brought that up that night. Never really stopped to pause, at least to ponder it for any period of time. You just accept it. You know, it's it's time. It's a clock that you're. It's in front of you again. Sixty seconds in a minute. Sixty minutes in an hour. You just. It's it's just rules that we all, I guess, play by. You know, we, we don't question them. So my question is this, which I've already answered, but I'll present to you. When, if ever, did you ever stop to really think about the concept of of time itself? You know, it's one of those things. 
I mean, I suppose I've probably done it, but I've never really given it a lot of thought. I mean, That's kind of where I was at. It seems like, you know, your life progresses and time goes by and we all age and you have to have some way to measure it. So <laughs> I, I never, I've never really given the concept of time a lot of thought. Well, he, he shared that wherever this was, it was something online that he had saw that he, he kind of tied it back or the original person tied it back to biblical. And he said, you know, Moses and, and a lot of the characters out of the Bible were, they lived thousands of years. But did time mean the same thing at that time yeah, did, did as they what measure it does their years to differently us? Or you know, did time flow different? Or yeah, anything? yeah. So, and again, I had just never really stopped to think about it. But it was intriguing, and I thought that that kind of goes with tonight's topic. But that's what drew me to tonight's topic to to begin with. Well, we hope that you've enjoyed your time that and, you've and spent with us. Had a good time listening. A, a good time listening to this podcast. We hope we didn't waste your time. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate each and every one of you. Thanks for listening, folks. Hey, real quick, call to action. I think Eric would agree. We'd like to grow this. Nightmares on the Lost Highway. Absolutely. If you could, if you're listening on Apple, if you would go and give us a review and, and rate us. Uh, if you have some feedback, that's fine, too. Uh, whatever, whatever platform you're listening, follow us, rate us, give us some reviews. That helps get some recognition. And gets our name out there. We do have a Facebook page, Nightmares on the Lost Highway. You can easily find us if you want to communicate with us. If you want to share some uh, possibilities for future podcasts with us, you know, reach out. We want to talk with you guys. Back in November of 2023, this was by Michael Marshall. That was almost my headline. Oh, really? I think, if you're, if you're talking about the same one. About a successful raid by the Roy Air Force Squadron on the Hamburg Shipyard. The resem... Roy or Royal? Royal. Typing here. Thank you. I want to take a time to thank the people that helped bring this all together. Uh, Alex Tudor, you can almost call him our producer at this point. Sarah Tudor, who also helps with some of the technical stuff. I want to take a moment to extend thanks to Eric for letting us use his space to record in kind of our makeshift studio. I, in turn, would like to thank Bill for, one, putting up with me and uh, using this camaraderie to do something we both very much love and enjoy doing, and thank Bill's family for allowing him to spend all the time to work and clean up our recordings and present them in what uh, you hear in the final uh, terms, uh, the final edition, if you will. And I'd like to thank all of you for continuing to, to listen. I know we've got some loyal followers out there. We do this as a labor of love. But we're, we're happy that there are people that enjoy it as, hopefully as much as we do. Thank you very much.